Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. I'm so glad to see everybody here, and it's good to see your happy, smiling faces. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning, the opportunity to come and to gather, to have fellowship with one another, that which you have commanded us to do. We, we do it for a great pleasure for us, and we're glad to be together. We pray that you help us today as we look at your word as we look at how you stepped in and changed all of history by sending your only son. I pray that you'd help us to understand something more about you, that you might help us to be more like you. So, Lord, we're here. I pray that you touch every heart, wherever it is that we come from, whatever it is that we're going through. Lord, I know that you have a, a word for each one of us. So, Lord, as we look into your eternal word, I pray that we would hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, so we are back in the book of Luke. We're going to go through verse 47 to verse 80. It sounds like a challenge, doesn't it? It's all right. It's a narrative. Luke, being a doctor, understanding details, going about like a reporter, gathering information and going and taking information. We have a lot of unique things here in the book of Luke that you don't have in the other gospels. If you didn't have the book of Luke, you wouldn't have the Christmas story, for instance. You wouldn't have the Magi. You wouldn't have all of that, which uh, we're going to look at today, the birth of John the Baptist and his parents and the circumstances behind all that. So you have Luke kind of trailing behind all of the events and now taking down all the facts. He's the most prolific writer, actually, in the New Testament, even more than Paul, since he writes not just the Gospel of Luke, but also the book of Acts. And as you can see, this this particular chapter one has 80 verses in it. So it, it is fairly prolific, but we're going to rifle through it because it's a narrative. Narrative where you're just reading a story and, and taking observations. Luke shows us Jesus as the son of man, that he is connected to us, that he is not so unlike us. And yet he is the son of God, but he was born of a woman, born of a virgin to break the sin in the human race. In Luke chapter 1, verses 78 and 79, it, this is Zechariah speaking when he's finally able to. And he says, Through the tender mercy of our God with which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So you see, once Zechariah's tongue is loosened from his discipline because he didn't have faith, he didn't believe what the angel had told him, he finally busts out, and at the end of his uh, exclamation, he says this, and he's looking forward to the day spring, and, you know, I always thought that was a card company, <laughs> which it is, but the day spring actually refers to the sunrise. The day spring is the sun coming up in the east. Sometimes it's just the east, but uh, the day spring is the sun that rises, and also, that's where all the stars come from, too, if you notice. It all comes from that same side because of the way we're turning. I don't need to explain any of this to you. I know. So that's what it means. This day spring, the son of God coming and rising upon the darkness of our souls, which is a, a great word from him. So here we are at Grace Bible Fellowship, in case you forgot where we were. Getting back to what we looked at last week, if you remember, there was an announcement that was given that there would be a son born, and his name is to be John, met Zechariah inside the temple as he was burning incense and praying for the people. And he goes, how can I believe this? And Gabriel says, well, I'm Gabriel. I stand in front of the presence of God, and I was sent here to give you this message. So if you can't say anything nice, then you're not going to say anything at all until your son is born. And he shuts down his vocal cords. Uh, so you know what? You want to exercise faith. When an angel comes from God to tell you something, or let's say somebody in this room shares something with you, it'd be a good idea for you to listen. Chapter 1, verse 41, and it happened that when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, because you remember Mary coming to visit Elizabeth, that the babe leaped in her womb. Now remember, she's about six months pregnant. You guys do know that after 16 weeks, a, a fetus can actually hear. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she spoke out with a loud voice and said, 
Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. It's an amazing thing they hadn't met yet. And Mary was going to have to explain why she was pregnant and not married. A 14 to 16-year-old girl. She's going to her cousin's house, and she's going to have to explain all this. Well, the Holy Spirit made it really easy. Right? Because it's Elizabeth that tells Mary. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the your voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. How does she know all this? It says she was filled with the Holy Spirit. And there are things that the Spirit of God will tell you that you will know regardless of what anyone else has tried to keep a secret. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says that for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is a gift from God. It is not of works, lest anyone should boast. Mary believed. The difference between Mary and Zechariah, Zechariah didn't believe it. I'm too old. How is it, it, there's no way it's going to happen. Mary says, how is this going to happen? meaning that she believed it was going to happen. She just didn't know the vehicle in which it was going to come. And so she explained all that, and she believed. She put faith in that which God said. And you know, that's how every single person gets saved, is by putting faith and believing what God said is true, as opposed to how you feel or what the world says or any other sort of thing. You believe what God says. So she's actually leading the way for us and showing us how to have faith. I just want to warn you that there very well could be spontaneous outbursts of song and dance at any given time. As you go through the book of Luke, you're going to notice these songs that Luke makes a big deal of because he's taking it down. Now, not every single person in here sings a song, but there is a song, and it, she busts loose here. You're going to see that there are four of them, Elizabeth, Mary, Zacharias, and Simeon, who we're going to get to in the next chapter. And they compose some of the most beautiful poetry that you'd ever want to read about just being, just exalting God for everything that he's done. And so after Elizabeth comes out with this exaltation and makes this giant declaration, guess whose turn it is? It's Mary's turn. And this is what you might know as the Magnificat. And the reason they call it the Magnificat is because it's, it, it's another language and it sounds complicated. It actually means to magnify, which is in the very first line, and it's Latin for magnify. So this is, this is Mary's magnification, if you will. It begins in verse 46, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. You, you guys know what that means? You ever walk around and just forget that God is with you? And you just go about your business, you get distracted, and then suddenly you go, oh, yeah. He's right here. He's right here right now with me. And certainly he's right here in, in the Father's house, as the song says. To magnify means that you take something that could be just overlooked and that you get a much closer look at it. That's what it is when we worship God. We magnify, we concentrate our attention on, and we make that which seems to be far away and possibly could even be forgotten, we make it bigger. You can't make God any bigger than he is. You can't make him bigger, but you can see him in the largeness that he has. And very often we don't do that, and we just get tied up in our own little world. So Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. She's, she's showing us that there's a difference between a soul and a spirit. You know what your soul is, right? It's, it's the composite of all of your thoughts, all of your feelings, and your will. That's your soul. Your spirit is that which relates to God. Your soul largely relates to other people. Your spirit relates to God. And so for you to be able to pray in the spirit, for you to be able to walk in the spirit, means that you're doing this in a conscious connection with God and in fellowship with him. So she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. By the way, she's calling herself a doulo, which is the lowest slave in the house. 
She's saying, I am the lowest slave in God's house. That's a pretty good, healthy, humble view, right? I wonder if, I wonder if God came to me and told me I was, you know, something great was going to happen if I would feel like the, the lowest, you know, <laughs> of, of, the, of the world. Or if I would think, hey, you know, he picked a pretty good guy. <laughs> I would hope not. But Mary says, he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done these things for me. And holy is his name. So she realizes that she's going to become a celebrity. She's going to go from the lowest dulo to being a celebrity. And all other women from now on are going to call her blessed because she was able to bear the Christ. I don't believe in worshiping Mary because she's a person just like you and I. I don't believe that she was, in, you know, without a man uh, given to her mother as Jesus was. She was a woman. And it's interesting because she says, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoiced in God, my Savior. You see, Mary has to get saved and put faith in her son as her Savior. And so she's rejoicing in God, my Savior. He's regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. Behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. For he was mighty, has done great things for me, and holy is his name. She sees this as a personal thing. Now, if you were between 14 and 16 years old, unmarried, and the Lord said, you're going to get pregnant, and everybody's going to think that you were sleeping around. But the Spirit of the Lord is going to come upon you, and that's how it's going to happen. Would you say, wow, God's doing great things for me? <laughs> because if you remember, when they leave, she and her betrothed husband, when they leave and they go to Nazareth, which is where he's from, notice no one will take them in. That's where he's from. That's where his family is. And nobody takes them in. They couldn't even get, you know, a, a Motel 8. They, nothing. The family basically despised them because of this. And yet Mary doesn't see it that way. She says, the Lord has done great things for me. There's a lot to be said for your perspective. She could have said, ah, oh, I can't believe, why me? Could have picked somebody else, which is what Moses tried to do. You know, go, go pick somebody else. I, I'm not your guy. He's done great things for me and holy is his name and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. She sees God's faithfulness. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in their imagination and their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. She goes through a series of things, and without giving you all of the passages, this young girl knows the scriptures. There are several Psalms that are mentioned here. There's one from Isaiah, one from Malachi. I had the whole chart, and I figured I didn't want you guys to go to college this morning, so I, I, I'm omitting it and just giving you the bottom line. This girl knows the Bible, and what a great thing that is, because I don't know about you, but I've had to pull the sword out more than once even this morning to defend what's going on in my head or in my heart, what I see. It says in Psalm 119, 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Do you realize that the sword of the spirit is the word of God? And for you to try to rationalize away, reason away, uh, you, you know, um, make sure you're on the right balance of medication, vitamins and, and minerals, to try to regulate sin, forget about it. It's only going to be through the word of God. And knowing the truth, that's the only thing you're going to be able to fight the enemy with. And so that's what she is. She's full of God's word. It's interesting because when you look over the Magnificat, when you look over what she said, it sounds very familiar. I don't know about you, but as you read through, you go, this is very familiar. Well, it's also, she's pulling from all these different scriptures, but there's a similarity. There's salvation, humility, power, faithfulness, and justice. Ultimately, that God will come in and be just because he remembers 
his promise to Abraham. If you look here in 1 Samuel, another woman who was barren, who had no children, finally God had granted her her prayer and gave her a child who would be Samuel. And after she gets pregnant with Samuel, this is her magnificat, if you will. Hannah prayed and said, my heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. We actually sing a song with that line in it. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. Sounds very familiar to what Mary was saying. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Notice she said that also. Even the barren has borne seven, and she who has, has had many children has become feeble. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength no man shall prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed you know, she speaks of is Jesus, whom Mary is now bearing. And Mary bursts into song just like Hannah did. And there's a lot of very familiar themes that come through here. And you'll see it follows through without pulling it entirely apart. I don't know about you, but in a world that's gone crazy and it looks like it's gone to hell in a handbasket, I read something like this and I take heart. God is the one who kills, and he's the one who makes alive. He can bring you down to the pit, and he can raise you up. You know, God can do anything he wants. He can take presidents, senators, representatives, and he can bring them down in a heartbeat. And I'm glad to know that. I'm comforted to know that. Because this is not our home, boys and girls. This is just a temporary stay, and everything that we go through is a test. When I read things like this, it encourages my heart to remember that God is on the throne. So this is Hannah's Magnificat, if you will. So meanwhile, while all of this is going on, while Mary has gone to see Elizabeth, there's something else happening back behind the scenes. And Luke doesn't tell us anything about Joseph. What's going on with this guy who hears that, you know, you know he went to the matchmaker, he made him a catch, but, you know, she's pregnant and it wasn't me. Imagine how disappointing that is. A man who's getting ready to marry a woman and find out that she's pregnant and then she makes up this entire story, seemingly. I mean, I think about the disciples when Jesus rose from the dead. The women came and said, we've seen him, he rose from the dead, and nobody believed him. They, they didn't believe the word of women <laughs> in that day. They held no weight. In fact, the woman wasn't even able to go to court and testify. Her, tes her testimony was uh, disqualified because she's a female. And yet the scripture tells us, let a woman learn. That's what the New Testament says, which is very forward thinking. But now we're going to look back and see what's going on here with Joseph. It says here in Matthew 1, 18 to 25, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. You see, young girls very often were engaged, very, very young, sometimes as young as two years old, they have records of, where the families get together and they say, yeah, let's, let's make this match. And then they go into the betrothal thing, which is a year. There's one year where they're betrothed, and it's almost as binding as a marriage, but there's no living together, there's nothing uh, all... Dating is supervised. It's, it's very, very structured. 
And if something were to happen there, it's like a divorce and a woman found pregnant in that situation would be available to be stoned to death according to the law of Moses. They would stone you, they'd put you in a hole and they would stone you to death. They'd throw manure on top of you and plant a tree. That's what they would do. So if you walk into a town with a lot of trees, you better be careful. You know, it's like a pirate sailing into port and seeing people, their, their remains hanging up as a warning to other pirates. You know, you tend to, I wonder if they instituted the death penalty, if there'd be less shootings. Well, I don't know. I'm sorry. You, you caught me dreaming. <laughs> Joseph did not want to put her away. He didn't want to divorce her, essentially, and he didn't want to open up her to a public scandal. He was a just man, and he knew he was not the father, but he didn't want to humiliate her because he loved her. What a great balance of grace and law. But he thought about these things, and behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So he had to get confirmation from an angel in a dream before he believed. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That, ladies and gentlemen, is called the gospel. So all that was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took to him his wife. And he did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So he did everything that he was supposed to do. He took her as a, a wife, and yet he did not consummate the marriage until after, until after until after. There are some people who believe Mary never ever had sexual relations with Joseph, but how do you have all these half brothers and sisters of Jesus? And the scripture says here that he did not sleep with her in the common vernacular until after. You know what that means? That's right. Just thought I would point that out to some of you. Moving on here in verse 56, and Mary remained with her, meaning Elizabeth, about three months. So she was there from the sixth month to the ninth month. Guess what that means? She was there when John was born. She was there to help Elizabeth in the, in the pregnancy and returned to her house. My wife also lets me know that's probably where she learned how to give birth because you don't go to a hospital, you, you don't have a, somebody come in, a professional, you end up doing all that stuff yourself. Can you imagine that, ladies? Yeah. Having to give birth and, you know, the, the whole umbilical cord, the placenta, and, the, you know, all of that, episiotomy, and, you know, oh. <laughs> I know too, I've seen too much. <laughs> and she returned to her house. Now, Elizabeth... Now Elizabeth full time, full time came to her and to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. What a surprise. And her neighbors and her relatives heard, and so they rejoiced with her. And you can imagine what that looks like. So it happened on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. Yes, that's a moil. And he has a, he has a blade. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that I wasn't aware as a child. Because <laughs> that's some scary stuff. But that's a whole procedure. And on the eighth day is actually when this occurs. So it's actually, you know, after your one-week birthday, ha-ha, I got a present for you. Meet the moil. And on the eighth day, actually, vitamin K, which is hugely important for clotting, is at its peak on day eight. Who knew? 
You know who knew. And so they were ready to call him Zacharias after his father. Zacharias 1, Zacharias 2. That makes sense, right? His mother answered and said, no, he shall be called John. You know why his mother answered? Because Zachariah couldn't. <laughs> you know whose job it was to name the child? It's the prerogative of the father. And it looks like this woman has just taken the helm, you know. So we're going to name the baby Zachariah, right? No. We're going to name him John. And now these priests, his fellow priests and all of their friends in highly religious, very traditional circles are like, that ain't right. But they said to her, there is no one among your relatives who is called by this name. So it looks a little suspicious. Is the milkman named John? <laughs> and so they made signs to his father what he, would have, what he would want him called. Sometimes we read this stuff very casually. Remember, Zechariah couldn't speak, but he could hear. So they're making signs to him. <laughs> he can hear. Why are you making signs to a guy who can hear? Did you, did you ever see? How many of you never saw that before? Oh, good. So a little bit of my insanity is rubbing off on you. There it is. They made signs to him. You don't need to make signs to somebody who can hear. If he's deaf... Then you need to make, right, you guys understand how that works, right? It's like somebody has a blindfold on and you're speaking loudly. Because maybe they can't hear you. You're like, they got, we get confused. So they made signs to his father what he would have him called. And he asked for a writing tablet. And he said, his name is John. He didn't say, I want his name to be John. Let's call him John. His name is John. Now, that's a statement of faith right there. Because who told him? The angel told him to do that. But this tradition, this tradition of naming after the father, it just didn't happen. John means gift of God. Remember? Why would they call him that? Because he's a gift from God. Absolutely. Absolutely. So they gave him a tablet. It probably wasn't an, you know, a Kindle like it looks like this guy's holding. It wasn't a tablet like that. They gave him a tablet to write on, and he said his name is John. Here's somebody's rendition of what it may have been like with all of the priests as he writes out his name. And I like the fact that in the background, you'll see Elizabeth scowling like I told you, I told you, I told you it was John. Like they didn't believe her. So they had to make motions at her husband to get it from him. His name is John. Immediately, after this word of faith that came out of his mouth, immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed and he spoke, praising God. And then fear came on all who dwelt around them, and all these sayings were discussed throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all those who heard them kept them in their hearts, saying, what kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. So as soon as he said on the tablet, his name is John, he suddenly could speak. You know why? Because his discipline was over. He was sitting in the corner. The Lord put him in the corner because he didn't believe. And that was the end of his discipline. Okay, you're unshunned, you know. And now he's back. And suddenly his mouth opens up. Now, you might not know any Jewish priest, but you know a pastor. And if I was quiet for nine months, I bet you I would have something to say. And so Zechariah has something to say, so I'm going to put up the warning, subject to spontaneous outbursts of song and dance. And this is one of the songs that he takes down. Now his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. Interesting. We see three times the filling of the Holy Spirit. One is with Elizabeth. 
when she spoke. But before that, we saw John leap in her womb because he was filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb. We had Mary give us our, her Magnificat. And now we hear Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. So have your ears up for this. Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. To redeem something means you purchase it back. There's a price that you pay and you get something back. It's redeemed. That's what Jesus did for us. The cost of you and I having a relationship with God was the very life of Jesus Christ, and we were redeemed. Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and he has raised up a horn. A horn is always a symbol of power, by the way, of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began. And we should be, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all those who hate us. By the way, that's his interpretation. To perform the, the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, that oath which he swore to our father Abraham. By the way, you remember what his name means? God remembers. It's Zacharias, and his wife's name is Elizabeth, his God's oath. He remembers God's oath. So he's sitting here and saying that the oath in which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And you, child, speaking of his own son, will be called the prophet of the highest. For you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. You notice that he's saying the same thing that he was told from the angel? to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins, because Jesus takes away our sins. He doesn't just kind of pretend they're not there. Through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to give our feet into the way of peace. So the child grew and became strong in spirit. It was in the deserts, until the day of his manifestation to Israel. Imagine having a child that hung out in the desert. I don't know about you, but when we were kids, we used to love going to my grandmother's house because we would go in the backyard and they had, it was a creek and we would find all manner of living things and make sure that there wasn't an inch of us that wasn't covered with mud to the delight of my parents. Imagine John out in the desert from when he was young. So Zachariah is busted loose. He's busted loose after being quiet for nine months. He's got something to say. And notice he takes an entire page up, or it used to be an entire page up on the screen. I have no idea what happened. Well, here's a picture of John when he was young. I thought it was pretty cool. So here's this young boy growing up, and everyone's expectations are high. Like, what kind of a, kind of a child is this going to be? And Zachariah shut up for nine months, which is a, a miracle. And then he busts out with all this prophecy about how he would come. And he's announcing this to everybody that's there that's part of the circumcision. That's all part of the naming ceremony. And so you see little John growing up, um, you know, I... I I like to think of him preaching his first sermon at five, you know, full of the spirit of God, you know, preaching to the animals. I knew a young kid who used to do that. In Matthew 11, verses 8 to 14, Jesus says this of John later on in his ministry. He says, but what did you go out to see? Speaking of all the people that flocked out to see John to be baptized, a man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women... There is not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. 
Did you guys just catch that change in direction by Jesus? He's saying John, John the Baptist is the greatest prophet because he's more than a prophet. He's the one that comes just before the Messiah. And he's announcing himself, basically, as the Messiah. And he says, but the one to be greater than John, you have to be dead to yourself. Isn't that amazing? That's the way to the top is from the bottom. And you have to stay there. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. So John, the baptizer, is the last prophet of the Old Testament. Don't let him tell you it's Malachi if you're in one of those trivial pursuit games because there's scriptural principle right here. If you are willing to receive it, he is the Elijah who is to come because he came in the spirit and power of Elijah to announce the coming of Christ. They used to have people that would go before kings and they would clear the road. They would make sure there, there wasn't any debris in the way, the potholes got filled, so that when the king came through on his carriage, that it would be a smooth ride. And if you remember, one of the things John the Baptist said is prepare the way for our God. Make a highway through the wilderness. In other words, get the junk out of your life and get ready because Jesus is coming. Do you think it's true today? Get the junk out of your life, guys. We get so tied up in, in a lot of little things. Make a clear path so that it's going to be an easy transition. And you're not going to be heartbroken to leave the things in this world behind. I don't know about you. It's getting easier and easier for me to look to heaven and say, I'm glad to be out of here. Praise God. He, he says this interesting statement. Uh, I think I'm just going to let you guys be perplexed by. It says that the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, has been suffering violence. And the violent take it by force. Any of you confused by that? Two people. That's great. Okay, I'll talk to you later. The kingdom of heaven is laid hold of by that, those people who are forceful, like John the Baptist. That's what he means. It doesn't mean that the kingdom of heaven suffers because he was in you is greater than he was in the world. So heaven's not suffering from any evil impact. It means that heaven is going to be laid hold of by those who are like John, who don't put up with sin in their lives, who hate sin in their lives. And they take... You know, if your hand causes you to sin, you cut it off and throw it from you. Or if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it from you because it's better for you to enter into life maimed than it is in, to enter into hell with all your members. The kingdom of God is not for people who want to sit on the fence, be politically correct, compromise. The kingdom of heaven is held by those who are forcefully laying hold of it. That's what it means. Well, today was a short message. Jesus gives him a happy birthday. Next week is Christmas in June because we're going into chapter two, which you know is the Christmas story. You know Linus stands up and he gives his little soliloquy from the scriptures, which I think is the best part of the peanuts thing. But we're going to have Christmas next week so you guys can be ready for it.